Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, lovely to see everyone this morning uh, here in First Armagh on Sunday, the 11th of June. And a warm welcome to everyone, including those watching online. If you're visiting with us this morning, uh, we trust that you'll feel at home as you worship with us today. Just a few announcements. Uh, on Wednesday evening, the 14th of June, there is a prayer meeting at 6.30. Um, this prayer meeting, it's opened to everyone, so please come along. And it provides an opportunity to come together to pray for the uh, life and ministry of our church, the needs of our congregation, the city and the community that we serve. Following on, on uh, Wednesday the 14th, there's also a committee meeting starting at 7.30. Next Sunday, a uh, special day for the children, it's Prize Day, and uh, the service will be led by Matt Ball. After uh, the service, there's going to be a picnic in the Mall, so everybody is welcome. Just bring along your packed lunch and join in the fun. Uh, following the picnic, then we're going to have a short open air service on the steps of the church, and uh, that will start at approximately 2.30. Saturday, the 24th of June, uh, there is a barbecue planned uh, from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock uh, in the afternoon. If you're planning to attend, please add your name to the sheet, which is in the vestibule, or speak with Heather McRae. And then during July and August, um, we hope to open the church on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays from 12 to 3, 12 midday to 3 p.m. Um, we would like some volunteers to help with that. So if you are free and can help, please put your name on the sheet which is in the vestibule or speak with Don McDowell. It's always wonderful to bring good news and um, in fact, it's even better when we see the parents here. So uh, our warmest congratulations to Ashley and Christopher Boyd, who uh, had a little baby boy who arrived last Monday. We don't have a name yet for the baby boy, but uh, anyway, that's fine. And it's just lovely to see you both here this morning with your new baby. And uh, also warm congratulations to the very proud grandparents, uh, Karen and Stephen and Tracy and Nigel. Wonderful news. Um, today we welcome back the very Reverend David Clark, who is no stranger to our pulpit. And uh, the Reverend Clark, it's always a pleasure to have you here leading our worship, so thank you. Thank you, Ruth, for those announcements and for your kind words of welcome. And uh, could I also endorse the words of congratulations that you've addressed earlier. It is a joy and a privilege to be with you in First Armagh. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise, wrote the psalmist. And we are going to strike that note as we sing together in our Irish Presbyterian hymn book, number 230. Praise the God of our salvation all life long your voices raise. Let us worship God.
And now let us join together in prayer. Let us all pray. Happy they whose hopes are founded in the God of earth and sky. Almighty God, because our hopes are founded in you, we come together to worship today. Coming from many different places, with many different needs and different experiences, yet with one common purpose, to worship and to praise you, and to seek the blessing and renewal which only you can give. In these bright days of early summer, we acknowledge you as the God of matchless power, who called this marvelous world into being and set the stars in order. We rejoice that your ways are so much higher than our ways and your thoughts than our thoughts. And we rejoice that your goodness to us never fails. The gifts of common grace have been our experience, the health and strength that brings us here, the love and joy of family and friends so precious to us, the freedoms of movement and expression that we enjoy in our democratic world. But we worship you especially because of that grace that has reached out to us in Jesus Christ. You sent Jesus Christ into our world to rescue and to redeem a fallen and wayward people and to open up for us a new and living way into your presence. We thank you for that initiative that you took at Bethlehem and which culminated at Calvary, where he opened that new and living way for us. We thank you for your love, O God, but we thank you also for your patience, because we acknowledge that we are often frail and forgetful people. We lay our sins and failings before you in the quietness of these moments. Jesus, our Savior, spoke about the poor in spirit and the pure in heart, the meek and those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. He desired love without any limit, purity without any spot, forgiveness without any reservation, trust in you without any anxiety. And we confess that we fail in these aspects of our living day by day. Forgive us if we have not loved one another as Christ loved us, if we have nursed a grievance against anyone or been bitter and resentful by life's experiences, if we have forgotten our promises and broken our word. And although these failures constantly accuse us, we ask just now for your forgiveness and your pardon. Release us from the burden of our sin. Help us to step into this new day and this new week, confident and unafraid, knowing that we never fall beyond the reach of your mercy. And minister to us by your spirit during this hour of worship. May we not only sense your presence, but hear your voice and lay hold on life eternal. And this we ask through Jesus, our Redeemer, and for his sake. Amen. Our first reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 6, and we read from verse 25, a portion of our Lord's Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6 at verse 25, hear the word of God. Jesus, Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? 
And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Ending there at the end of chapter 6, and may God bless to us his truth. And now I'd like the girls and boys to meet me at the front of the church, please. Good morning, girls and boys. It's lovely to see you all at church this morning. Enjoying all this wonderful weather? Yeah, outdoors, playing all sorts of games? Yeah? Good, good. Oh, more coming. Great. Now, I've got something here. Very, very simple things to show you. Oh, gone through the bag. Very, very simple things indeed. You've got no problem recognizing. What's this? Oh, there was a spoon somewhere. <laughs> oh, it's here, the bag, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, what do you use these things for? For eat, of course you do, yes. Now, this morning when I left home, this was the biggest fork I could get. This was the biggest spoon I could get. <laughs> now, I want you to imagine. Good at imagining things, yeah? I want you to imagine a spoon that's even longer than this one, much longer than this one, okay? And I want you to imagine a fork that's much longer even than this one. You with me? Yeah. Now, one night, a man had a dream. And in his dream, someone came to him and said, I want you to, I want, I want you to learn something. I want you to follow me. And in his dream, he followed this man and they came to a door, okay? And he opens the door, and in the, in the room, there's this huge table, long table. And all around the table, there were people sitting on both sides. And on the table, there were bowls of food. Now, what's your favorite breakfast cereal? Sorry? Frosties, anybody else? Cocoa Pops. Cocoa Pops. Weetabix, very good. And what's your favorite tea time? What favorite meal you have at tea time? Pasta. pasta. Okay, pasta. Right, okay. There's great bowls, the great bowls of pasta here on this table. And great bowls of Weetabix and all the. Uh, noodles. Noodles, okay. Pot noodles if you want. That's all right. Anyway, lots of food on the table. <laughs> but the food is spattered all over the table. The food is spattered all over the table because, you see, these people are sitting and they've got these long spoons and even if they get the spoon into the bowl of food, they can't get it into their mouth because their arm isn't long enough and the spoon is so long it goes past their ear. Okay. So the food's spattered everywhere and everyone is unhappy. And the man said in the dream, that's hell. But I want to show you something else. So he took him along to another room, opened the door, and there's the same thing. Big long table, people on both sides of it, bowls of food everywhere. But everyone's happy. And there's no food splashed all over the table. 
And he said to the man in the dream, how come that in one room it's all foods everywhere and everybody's unhappy, and yet in this room everybody's happy and fed, there's no food lying about? And the man said, but you see, that's heaven. That's heaven. Because the people are using the big long spoons not to feed themselves, but to feed the people on the other side of the table. You see, <laughs> the long spoon enables people to feed on the other side of the table when they can't feed themselves. That's heaven. Not feeding yourself, not thinking about yourself, but thinking of the other person, doing what you could to make them happy, to satisfy their needs, to minister to them. That's what Jesus said, you know. The real, the real secret of life, says Jesus, is not to do what you want to do, but to do to other people the kind of thing you would like them to do to you. Using the big long spoons to help others, and they in turn help you. We're going to sing your hymn. It's number 568. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Thinking of other people first. That's the real thing. That's the secret.
At this stage of our service, we bring our offerings to God. Your offerings will be received. And now let us join in our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are the God of all the earth. And so we come presenting our prayers for your troubled world. Day by day, we learn of death and destruction in Ukraine, train tragedies in India, political maneuvering in the United States and in our own United Kingdom. And we are reminded of the need of your controlling sovereign power and your grace acting in human life. We pray for all who lead in the nations of the world, that they may strive to build a world order of peace and understanding. And we pray for our own land. We think even of that search that is continuing even today in Balamina. We pray that if it be your will and purpose, that that search may be successful and that that young lady be returned safe and well to her own home and family. We think of others who are vulnerable in our time of pressure and stress. For the poor who are aware of things they cannot aspire to. For the marginalized, those who suffer because of their gender, their race or their color and who feel that everything is against them for the lonely and all who long for companionship and understanding. We pray today for our Presbyterian Church in Ireland, soon to meet in its annual meeting of General Assembly. Be with the outgoing moderator, Dr. Kirkpatrick, and the incoming moderator, Dr. Mahwini, and grant that they may continue to lead in obedience to your truth and to inspire and unite our people. May we as a church be ever willing to learn, prompt to acknowledge our failures, and to realize that people are much more important than buildings, and that prayer is more vital than man-made schemes. We pray for this congregation of your people. We think of the one who ministered here formally with such acceptance, We pray your hand of healing upon Tony. May he and his wife and family know your blessing and your comfort. And grant that his progress may continue with speed and satisfaction. That he may continue to enjoy a rich and fulfilling period of retirement. And we pray for the plans for next week's Children's Day. And the time of social gathering that will follow. And the opportunity to of witness and proclamation as an open air service is held. May this congregation know the guidance of your spirit in these days of vacancy and that through the various agencies and our presbytery may a satisfactory conclusion to that vacancy soon follow that your work and witness here in this place may continue to the glory of your name. We pray as individuals in need of your grace and truth. Help us always to be lovers of truth. Deliver us from the cowardice or prejudice that shrinks from new truth or the laziness that is content with half truth and the arrogance that thinks it knows all truth. Keep us humble 
looking ever to you. And grant that by your grace, we may be proud to be humble in your presence rather than proud, to be generous rather than mean, to be unselfish and self-effacing rather than self-seeking. Make us willing workers in your kingdom, that kingdom of truth and righteousness and peace, which it is your purpose to unfold. And hear us as we unite in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our second reading is in the Gospel of John, in chapter 15, where we read in verses 1 to 8. John's Gospel, chapter 15. Hear the word of God. Jesus said, I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. So that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Ending at verse 8, may God bless to us his truth and to his name be glory and praise. We join in congregational praise now once more. Our Irish Presbyterian Hymn Book, number 502, I Need You Every Hour. And we thank Roberta at the organ today. I need you every hour. Let us sing to God.
Let us join in prayer. Almighty God, we meet in your presence. May your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and your greater glory our supreme concern. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. I wonder, do you know this verse from Rudyard Kipling? I have six honest serving men. They taught me all I know. Their words are what and why and when and how and where and who. Those simple interrogatives, through them we learn and gather information. And by other simple words, we make human life tolerable. Words like thank you, sorry, well done. A few years ago, James Simpson of Dornoch Cathedral was moderator of the Church of Scotland. And in his visit to our Irish Presbyterian Assembly, he told a story. A story about a colleague of his who was a regular broadcaster on radio and television in Scotland. One year, this colleague was entrusted with the Christmas Day service. Now, he happened to have two old aunts who had been at loggerheads for years. And during the broadcast, he suggested that there was no better day than Christmas Day for saying sorry, ending old disputes. Why not, he said, why not, when this broadcast is over, go to your telephone and make that important call? Late that Christmas night, his own phone rang. It was one of his aunts. I saw you on television this morning. I was proud of you. So would your mother have been if she'd been spared. And you know what? I took to heart everything you said. I went and sat beside the phone. And you know, Jeannie never phoned me. Sometimes we need to say sorry to others. Sometimes sorry is the hardest word. Sometimes we need to say to ourselves, it's over. That's one of the most valuable lessons in life that we can learn. To leave, close the gates behind us. To leave the regrets and disappointments of the past and not to let them cast a cold hand on the future. You know the serenity prayer, which contains so much wisdom. Lord, grant me the grace to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. But it's another word that I think is essential to our Christian vocabulary that I want to emphasize this morning. Just one word. The word therefore. It's a word beloved of mathematicians and philosophers. I think therefore I am, said Descartes. And that's my text, one word, therefore. And my theme, learn to say, therefore. It's a word that reminds us that Christianity doesn't just deal with our emotions or our needs. But Christianity addresses our minds. We have to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the word suggests reasoning and conclusions that are reached after a consideration of certain realities. It's frequent in the Bible. It looks back and it looks forward. It says, in the light of all that has gone before, therefore, we will do certain things. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 in the first 11 chapters, Paul has been outlining all that God has done, the great saga of redemption. And then he writes, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. We need to say, therefore. Five very quick points. God is my father. Therefore, I will not succumb to worry. We read in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6 
how Jesus mentioned lives that were spent in anxious concern about what they would eat or drink or wear. But, says Jesus, life is more important than all these trappings. Such worry, he says, is pointless. It cannot add to your height or lengthen your years. God provides for the birds. He clothes the lilies of the field. Surely you can trust him to care for you. Now, that might sound terribly glib, as though our lives should be totally carefree. After all, none of us is immune to the assaults of worry. We, li we live in a dangerous and a pressurized world. We, we naturally worry about our family and our health, our job and our finances. And sometimes troubles come, not single spies, but in battalions. And of course we worry. And besides, the Bible encourages careful planning. And we shouldn't abandon realistic caution and provision. But what is Jesus speaking about? Is he suggesting that worry is a sin? A, a sign of some fundamental spiritual flaw? No. He is not saying that worry is a sin. He is saying that worry is illogical. It's illogical. He's condemning the corroding care that fails to take account of a father's love and compassion. God provides for the birds, for the grass of the field, for the lilies. He'll also provide for you. On one occasion, news was brought to the great missionary Hudson Taylor about rioting near one of his mission stations in China. The person was, who brought the news was astonished at Taylor's attitude because Hudson Taylor began to whistle a tune. And, and the messenger voiced his frustration and his surprise in angry words. How, how can you sit there and whistle while lives are in danger? And no sooner had the words crossed his lips than he recognized the tune, the tune that Taylor had been whistling. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. God is my father. Therefore, I will not succumb to worry. My father, secondly, is the gardener. Therefore, I will not be surprised by discipline. There's a famous story of a day in the life of the writer John Stuart Mill, who arrived at the door of the historian Thomas Carlyle in London's Chelsea. Mill had a dreadful message to convey. Some days earlier, Carlyle had lent him a copy of a book he had been writing, the result of years of research, a history of the French Revolution. And remember, there were no computers in those days, no memory sticks, only handwritten pages. Mill had to record that his over-enthusiastic kitchen maid had used the pages to light the fire. And Mill was there to tell Carlyle that everything had been destroyed. Years of work. Carlyle took the sacrifice, the setback, with, with great pluck. He said to his wife, we must not let Mill see how serious this business is for us. And in his diary, here's what he wrote. It is as though the celestial schoolmaster had handed my book back with the comment, it is not good enough, boy. You must do it again. And of course he did. And that, says Jesus, is how we should regard reverses. In John's gospel, Jesus claims to be the true vine. His father is the gardener. And the gardener desires fruitfulness. And to ensure that the 
To ensure fruitfulness, he prunes the fruit-bearing branches. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. My father is the gardener. Therefore, I will not be surprised by discipline. You see, the Christian faith does not promise exemption from life's storms and reverses. The Bible never promises that we shall float to heaven on flowery beds of ease. God's great intention for you and for me is that we should become more like Christ. And for that to happen, some things need to be cut away. If Jesus, as the New Testament says, needed to be made perfect through suffering, can we expect it to be any different for us? And this is a truth that all the masters of the spiritual life recognize. The great covenanter Samuel Rutherford put it like this. Why, why should I start at the plow of my Lord that makes deep furrows in my soul? He is no unwise husbandman. He purposeth a crop. He's doing something. The preacher Henry Ward Beecher said, Troubles are often the tool by which God fashions us for better things. And the modern, modern American Jeff Bridges, There is no such thing as pain without a purpose in the life of a believer. Thirdly, God is my refuge. Therefore, I will not yield to temptation. Temptation is one of the realities of the spiritual life. Daily we, we fall in thought and word and deed. And so often we are quick to excuse ourselves. But the Apostle Paul would have none of that. He told the Corinthians that he wasn't impressed by that excuse. The Corinthians, of course, were a fairly corrupt and ill-behaved sort of people. They even applauded what we would call pretty wretched behavior. And Paul says to them, no excuses. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out that you can stand up under it. No excuses for your behavior in Corinth. There's always a way out. In the book of Genesis, we learned how Joseph, a captive in Egypt, slipped out of the grasp of the voluptuous wife of Potiphar. He took the way of escape, running, leaving his garment in her hand. And God provides it. And it's up to us when temptation comes to seek to find it. Martin Luther rightly said, you cannot stop the birds flying over your head, but you can prevent them from making a nest in your hair. God is my refuge, therefore I will not yield to temptation. God, fourthly, is my provider, therefore I will be content. At the end of a passage writing to the Philippians, where Paul boasted that he had learned to be content, he said this, this great promise, my God shall supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. We, we live in a greedy and avaricious society where people are obsessed with getting more and more of everything. One writer put it like this, squirrels bank ten times as many hickory nuts as they can ever use. And how much honey the clever bees collect do the clever bees eat? Some people treat life like a game of Monopoly. 
as if the winner is the one who has the most things at the end. But all these things vanish away. We can take none of them with us. As Jesus said, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? My God shall supply all your need, says Jesus, says the New Testament. Therefore, I will be content. A great man and his wife once stood outside a jeweler's window in London's West End, and the wife sighed, so many things in that window I can't afford. And her husband responded, so many things in that window I don't need. God has provided, promised to provide and supply our need. Oh, not our greed, our need. And therefore, we will be content if we take the promises of Scripture seriously at all. And finally, Christ is my Redeemer. Therefore, I will not live for self. Writing to those same Corinthians, Paul says, You are not your own. You were bought at a price on Calvary. Therefore, honor God with your body. The mood which says, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, is not a Christian sentiment. Because of what Christ has done for us, redeeming us at Calvary, we are not in the business of living for self. The Christian is called to deny self, to take up the cross and follow Christ. And to live not for our own sense of fulfillment and achievement, but to bring glory to him. A visitor to an African mission station once noticed a nun engaged in washing the sores of a leprosy patient. And he turned his head away from the unpleasant sight. And he said, I wouldn't do that for a thousand dollars. And the nun looked up and smiled and said, neither would I. She was doing it out of love. She had learned that she belonged to Christ, was not living to please herself, but rather to please the one who loved her and gave himself for her. Christ is my Redeemer. Therefore, I will not live for self. Learn to say, therefore. Let us pray. Help us, O oh God, to love you with heart and soul and mind and strength. Write on our hearts the promises of the Scriptures. And give us the grace and strength to rely upon them and to live with confidence in your sight and for your glory. Amen. Our closing praise is the hymn 104 in our Irish Presbyterian hymn book, Guide Me, O My Great Redeemer.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. <laughs>